Oh, hey. 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 Good. Now it says we're live. Are we actually live? We're live. We're oh. live. Oh, shit. Okay. Calling, <laughs> calling yeah. Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson actually in London as I speak. And calling Rick Byer in? Chicago. Yeah. And we're yeah. live now, aren't we? We are live for the first time in 27 wow. days or 28 yeah. days. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. How are Welcome you? to 2024, everybody. How are your holidays? My holidays were lovely. We yeah. stayed at home almost yeah. the whole time. So that did was do, nice. Did you do the post New Year's weigh in? I mean, how? how... I weigh the same amount. Oh, I, you lie like I am 197 and a half you baby, lie like every a... day. Yeah. Oh, please. I can't seem to change that. Uh, welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a variety of history tours in Europe, the US, and the Pacific. Check it all out at stephenambrosetours.com. And whether you're watching live or watching on replay or listening on the HHH podcast, thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about John Hancock. So let us know that you're here. Let us know what you're drinking. Chris, do we did I mean did we lose everybody over no, the uh, holidays or did anybody no. come back today? We've got quite a few. Uh Brian Peacock's joining us uh from PA and, and Doug McCord also from Pennsylvania. So and the Templins. So we have a strong Pennsylvania contingent. Uh Jim Stark, uh David Picker also from Pennsylvania. I Who's see Ross Pennsylvania? W who just joined as a top shelf patron. Maybe this is a good time to mention that, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, you can support us. And we thank everybody who supports oh, yeah. us. You may notice the names are getting a little smaller, Chris. And we really appreciate that, yeah. We had some new people. Uh, uh, Homer Hodge just re-upped. Brenda Carlin came on. Chuck Court uh, and, um, and Ross W. So um, thank you, guys. And you can join us either as a Top Shelf patron or a Patreon supporter at any level. And we do appreciate them all at patreon.com slash History happy hour. Yes. So, um, wow, yeah. um, there it is. We've killed. Have we killed enough time? I think so. We have quite a few people, and I just. I also want to like shout out uh, Lizzie Borden. So we have so somebody here representing the, this side of the puddle. Oh, so, very well. Yes, yeah, we thank have you. Somebody from the uh, the London uh, uh, London area. Uh, London, Greater London Metropolitan. That side of the pond. Yes, the, right. the losing side in the. Excuse me. Let's not get started. The show. Ha the show hasn't even started yet. I mean, come on. All right. Give me a cue. All right. Oh, I, I'm... <laughs> Open. The bar is open. I mean, I almost didn't man, I, 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 the I, open of the show. I'm a little yeah. rusty in the trigger finger. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about John Hancock and the uh, early days of our country, the pre-early days of our country, with someone who loves history and beer as much as we do. Which is you know, so rare. So Brooke Barbier is a public historian who received her PhD in American history from Boston College, specifically researching Boston's social and cultural life during and after the American Revolution. In 2013, she founded Ye Old Tavern Tours. This is something that we should be going on, which offers tours of Boston's historic sites and taverns and beer is included. And she is the author of a new book, which is called King Hancock, and it's about the how shall we describe him, Chris? Well, you and I would probably describe him differently, Rick. So I would let you describe him. the patriot leader yes. <laughs> and lead signer of the Declaration of Independence. So we bring on and say hello to Brooke Barbier. Brooke, how are hello. you? Hi, guys. Cheers. Hi. Cheers. Oh, hey, look at that. What, what are you drinking? I have what I'm calling a John Hancock. It's a cocktail. Oh. Yeah, it's Madeira based because John Hancock loved Madeira and with some pins and ginger beer. So it, it tastes like a Coke, but then I've made it a cherry Coke by adding some cherry liqueur and some some preserved cherries. So wow. it's like cherry John Hancock. I, you know, I admire somebody that not only drinks when they talk about history, but puts a lot of thought and investment into it. Because Rick <laughs> yes. did a beer and I just did a scotch, but really hats off. That's Yeah. <laughs> We, we appreciate it, and our audience appreciates it. Look, everybody knows the name John Hancock, and everybody, at least in the U.S., knows that there his name is um, at the bottom of the Declaration of Independence. 
a little bit larger, a little bit bolder than the other signatures. And honestly, Brooke, that's all they know about him. That's all many people know about him. So if you can start by giving us uh, the quick overview, a sense of who he was and why you decided to write about him. Who John Hancock was, was a merchant who lived in Boston. Merchant at this time meant he imported and exported goods to and from Boston and had several stores in Boston. He had inherited this business from his uncle. That's important to know that when he was seven, his dad died and he went to live the rest of his life with his uncle who had founded this company, the House of Hancock. When John Hancock was 27, his uncle dies and he inherits all of these business holdings. Not coincidentally at this time when he suddenly becomes a very wealthy man, he also gets a lot of attention and begins to be, get elected to political office. Hancock would eventually go on to become one of the most popular men in colonial North America. That is not an exaggeration. While we know his name today, in the 18th century, every American would have known his name. He becomes famous for that signature in his life and then much later in his life. And he signed first because he was the president of the Continental Congress. All right. Rick? That Chris, was it's so why, <laughs> Chris, we all well, no, we know all about back him now. and forth. You know all about him then, right? Okay. Oh. We, you want to end the oh. show now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to end now. Well, Thank you very much, Brooke. Yeah. Oh, we appreciate your it's coming. It's kind of on. a source file today. No. So, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about uh, one of the things that I was interested in and I think is important. Uh, talk a little bit about um, his education and where you kind of think his sort of thought process comes from and, and and how that evolves. He was educated at Boston Latin School, which was a feeder school to Harvard. And then many students from Harvard would go on to become ministers. And that up until John Hancock's dad died would have seemed like Hancock's path in life. He was the son of a minister named John Hancock, who was the son of a minister named John Hancock. Stick with so, that, you know. Yeah, but for his dad dying, he probably would have gone on to become a minister and maybe not existed um, in the public realm at all. But that isn't what happened. When his dad dies, he goes to live with his uncle in Boston. He gets schooled at Boston Latin and then goes on to Harvard. And then his next step in his education is to act as an apprentice of sorts to his uncle. So that meant going around Boston and learning the business of the House of Hancock. And it also meant going to London and meeting some of the business partners there and spending time there as well. So is there any indication, uh, though, like from his education that he was radicalized or he always had a chip on his shoulder or, or like, do we know much about sort of where he's for how he's forming these? Isn't that a question? So I wouldn't say Hancock's gift is not political ideology. What his gift is, is garnering public support. And if I had to uh, guess and make a very educated guess as his biographer, I would say that part of his, um, part of the reason he enters politics and likes it so much is because he wants to belong. When his dad dies, he goes to live with his uncle and his uncle is a shrewd businessman. That doesn't mean that he, he couldn't be a loving, loving guardian. But John Hancock le leaves aside his other two siblings. He leads, leaves aside his surviving mother and goes to live with an uncle and an aunt in the third largest town in colonial America and has to adjust to not just this new town, but this new home, much larger than the one he was used to, and these new guardians. And I think that it meant, and I say I think because we just don't have the evidence for it. He didn't have a diary where he wrote and he said, oh, I'm always longing to belong. But based on the, based on what we do know about him from his records or what other people said, it does seem like he spent his whole life wanting to feel seen and connected with people. And one great way to do that in the 18th century was in politics. And his uncle had his uncle and aunt had no other children, right? Is that correct? Yeah, and that's part of the reason why when John's dad, John, dies, that he goes to live with Uncle Thomas. Uncle Thomas had built this massive business, and 
in the 18th century, as in today, a common thing would be for the, the next the male heir to take over. And Thomas and his wife, Lydia, had no children of their own. Okay, and I just want to add, you know, since we're going to get into this, um, how did the family make all of its money? So this is what's so interesting, because when people hear that Hancock inherited his wealth, they think, oh, that's boring. That's like everybody else. But what's very different is that Thomas Hancock was the middle of three boys, and the eldest and the youngest went to Harvard. And Thomas was apprenticed out into Boston as a bookseller. And in his lifetime, in Thomas's lifetime, from apprentice to mogul, he built one of the largest fortunes in Massachusetts. That is unusual to rise so far above your station without marrying into money. So Uncle Thomas is smart and shrewd and smuggles and supplies the British army with provisions to combat the French. He goes on to buy real estate throughout New England. So he is an enterprising man, and but he builds that fortune on his own. Did you, did you, was that the smuggling was the part you're bringing? Well, no, that's, or that's, that's you, the, that's the at illegality. Here? I'm just like that he gets all of his money by charging the British government too much to feed the troops that are defending him. Uh -huh. But we'll get into that as we go forward. Hey, uh, Brooke, you call John Hancock actually in the subtitle of your book. My questions, I'm still questions based on the, you know, front cover. So I'll get to my questions based on the inside <laughs> soon. Um, you call John Hancock a moderate founding father. So what do you mean by that? Is he slow to champion the cause of independence? And if he is a moderate, as you say, how does he become, along with Samuel Adams, one of the two most prominent revolutionaries in Massachusetts and at that time in the in the 13 colonies who, uh, who the British really are most looking to string up if they can get their hands on them? I say, in, of course, Chris, in a legal, respectful. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, I say that Thomas Gage, who issues up, that's the general who occupies Boston in 1775. I say that he fundamentally misunderstands John Hancock and Samuel Adams by lumping them together, that they both are causing problems for the British Empire, but in, for different reasons. So I argue that Hancock's a moderate because he didn't tend towards the radical almost ever, even though he finds himself as one of the leaders of a revolution. But even more specifically, what we see with Hancock is that he goes in on the revolution and he comes out. He goes in and he comes out. Whereas someone like Samuel Adams, a radical through and through up until 1776, is always all in. He is always looking for some transgression by the British Empire. He is always trying to rile people up and see things from his perspective. Hancock, throughout the 1760s and 70s, is looking, well, up until 76, he is looking for a return to normalcy, that he will rebel against taxes. But then if there's some sort of solution with those taxes, whether most of them are repealed or they're all repealed, that's enough to satisfy him and he pulls out. Uh, to answer your question about independence, he is reluctant to declare independence and he's he's not the only one. Most uh, delegates to the Second Continental Congress were reluctant and they eventually, many things moved them forward um, politically, but um, Hancock took some coaxing and as late as April, 1776, John Adams says of his cousin, Samuel, that Samuel was very upset with Hancock because and was talking badly about him to other delegates because Hancock wasn't ready to declare independence. And can I do a follow up, Chris? Sure. Brooke, Brooke, did you say that that I think you said that Samuel Adams was a radical up until 1776? So I caught that. And like, what do you mean by that? It would uh, depend on how you view radical thereafter, that um, Adam seems pretty singularly focused on independence. But after that, he might surprise you with, in, my, in, what, in what I would say is a pretty conservative view. Once the war is won, once the Constitution of Massachusetts is ratified in 1780, I, I think that he becomes much more conservative. And those protesting 
or uh, wanting tax relief, he has much less sympathy for. So um, what, you know, one of the, and I, I should probably lay my cards out here as a proud descendant of loyalists, I, I you know, <laughs> have a, a different view uh, than Rick. But uh, one of the charges I've often do, do you, heard... Do you view us as still being part of, of Great Britain and that, that oh, we might just, reunite someday? It was just an unfortunate thing. And, you know, we're just going to have to deal with the consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, you yeah. broke a few eggs and you know, we'll have to move on. But um, one of the, the charges that I've always heard leveled against Hancock, and you, uh, I'm curious to get your opinion, is that he's not so much uh, a reluctant revolutionary as an opportunist. And the, part of the reasons mm -hmm. that he's he's in and out and off and on as he's, he's in this for himself. And I mean, that's um, certainly a charge that people at the time leveled against him. So how would, how would you answer that? Well, first let me address you being a descendant of loyalists <sighs> and I extend my sympathy and not yeah. in the way that you might think that like, Oh, you lost the war. It's to say it was a very difficult time for everybody. Yes. And yes. this is one of the things that I try to capture with Hancock is that while we know today who won the war and how things turned out, the, those living in the time did not. And they were making the best choices for themselves, for their families at the time. And being a loyalist, especially in and around Boston, was very, very difficult. Um, you might have your house smeared with, with manure. You might have your fence leveled. And... Uh, um, feel, feel the intimidation from your neighbors. So it's it, it's a difficult time for everybody to try and figure out what's the right uh, what's the right choice. And you can see Hancock in real time trying to figure this out. Right. So so th so no, I don't um, condemn loyalists at all. Right. <laughs> Rick does all the time. I, 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 I know it's. I know it's um, not as that it's easier to present history in this very clear black and white way, but life isn't black and white. Right. And so, so um, anyway, no, well, no thank you for that. Being descendant of loyalists. <laughs> um, as for John Hancock being an opportunist, that's a fair, an absolutely fair charge to level against him. I, I, the, the difference is, Two, two sort of things. I would say, one, show me a man at this time who was in politics who wasn't an opportunist, who wasn't doing something for, for themselves. Um, and then the other part I would say is that Hancock, um, he didn't make money during the revolution. He died with less than he inherited. And there's several reasons for that. But there were men who profited, financially profited from the war, and Hancock isn't one of them. Um, what he gains, and we've talked about this, is that he gains that popularity and that feeling of belonging that he so desperately wanted. So um, your book is great because uh, it, it, it goes into a lot of detail about a lot of stuff that I haven't seen in, in a number of other books. Uh, and one of the things that I, I kind of was attracted to uh, is you tell the story of one of Hancock's critics, who's a, a, a man named John Mean, M-E-I-N. M -E -I -N. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Who, who is a Scottish immigrant who comes to the colonies and who runs a bookstore. And, he's, and he kind of seems to have a grudge against Hancock from early on. And you devote a fair amount of space to this, not only to Mean and his complaints, but to how Hancock handles it. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And part of the reason I devoted the space I did was to what um, Chris and I were just chatting about is to show that this wasn't, the revolution wasn't a steady march towards the Declaration of Independence with everyone going all in. And even though some rebels, some patriots had decided to not import goods because of the Townshend duties passed, um, those were a tax on imported British goods. And so many colonies and eventually all 13 in North America decide to boycott British goods, because if you didn't import them, you couldn't, um, you wouldn't have to pay the tax. And Hancock is one of the leaders of this boycott. 
And uh, John Main, this newspaper printer, begins to use the Patriots non-importation agreement against them, saying, actually, some of you are importing goods to enrich yourselves or to you're playing fast and loose with some of your own agreements. And so John Main did what the Patriots did, which was publish the names of importers on his first page of the newspaper. So Eads and Gill did that for the Boston Gazette to intimidate people from not importing, because if your name was listed as an importer, then you many people would be upset with you. But Maine flips that and says, well, John Hancock actually imported goods that were in violation of this non-importation agreement. And here's the manifest from the ship. And this is really problematic for Hancock. In fact, Maine is, is being a little unfair by saying that Hancock's importing goods that weren't allowed because Hancock says these are allowed. Yes, they're from Britain, but there are some of those goods that are allowed. But Maine's publicity eventually makes Hancock have to stop importing. He says, don't send me anything at all because I because it's too troublesome for him publicly to be seen as someone violating this agreement that he tried to get everyone else on board with. Um, and then what he eventually does is he has powerful contacts in London. One of those London contacts is owed money by John Maine and Hancock eventually bankrupts John Maine trying to collect on this Londoner's debt. So he, he you know, freedom of the press is great. Yeah, on one side. <laughs> but maybe not so great if the press is against me. So um, that's maybe a little part of the opportunist. I'm glad you picked that up, Rick. That you was... know, I'm right. Oh, I'm right. I'm, I'm swift. I'm <laughs> and, and, and the other component here, too, is that John Adams served as Hancock's lawyer to um to try and recover uh Maine's debts. So Adams is John Adams is right there in the thick of this as well. If only the BBC had been, you know, if there was a BBC America channel Again, that no problem. Time, they no would have been all over this. They would have had guests on and it would have been it would have uh, been a spectacle been. to see. <laughs> Well, in some sense, too, there is this happening because Hancock gets maligned in a Newport newspaper in Rhode Island, and he defends himself in a Pennsylvania newspaper and a New York newspaper. This isn't just um, this isn't a transgression that just Boston is looking at. It's mm -hmm. it's being observed by other colonies as well. And Hancock began by having one of his employees defend him. And then it, he had to come out himself and say, I've never imported, this is, I'm being falsely represented. But it seemed, it seemed enough. I couldn't find a letter or an account of someone saying exactly, oh, now we don't trust John Hancock. But there was enough back and forth in the media and enough um, discussion as you're sort of alluding to, um, what might happen today but back back then there was you know some some back and forth in the newspaper and hancock eventually it wouldn't do for his employee to defend himself it had to be him mm. so one of the other things that you talk quite a bit about in the book that is that is an interesting point and it, and it, it raises questions that we can talk about but um is this his relationship with the masses or the lower orders or anything that you would like to say that you have a quote uh in the book talking about this and he says uh, you say that um uh, he, an observer at the time saying he is so frank and condescending to the lowest that one would think he was talking to his brother or a relative um, and kind of a relationship like that at that time uh, is unusual you certainly don't see it with Adams or any other so what is his relationship with people quote unquote beneath him and is it do you think it's a genuine one or is it I do actually think it's genuine and that's what makes it so that's what makes him so effective at it if he was faking it I don't think he would have been able to gain the popularity he did. And the account you just read is one of many when people say that he was good at mingling, he was good at connecting with people. I think he realized pretty early on where the power came from. And the power came from the lower orders working together in a group. They could be very intimidating, especially in Boston. They had a history of mob violence, which was permitted at the time in, in some social way to say, 
if you have a grievance and you you mob against that grievance, if that grievance is addressed, well, then you have to stop mobbing. And so Hancock saw the saw the power of mob violence. And and he also so he he knew that if he was to remain popular, it should be with those people. But he also loved to entertain. He loved to host people in his home and at taverns to his to and he would pay for it. And this was again a way that he connected with people. Alcohol brings people together. It does. I tell you to that. Here we are. Here we are. Yes. <laughs> and Hancock was so smart about that, about um, buying people food and drink and bringing them together, and uh, and that helped build this popularity in Boston and then the countryside of Massachusetts and then the other colonies. Uh, and I do find that it was sincere. There's one instance that you may recall in the book, it comes much later, when he's hosting, he's governor of Massachusetts, Hancock is, and he's hosting at least one French aristocrat in his home. And the Frenchman writes that he says there was a hatter at the dinner. That means a person who made hats. hats that right. is, far beneath Hancock's station as a governor and far beneath a French aristocrat. And he says, and the governor was friendly with him. And you can tell that the French aristocrat is is puzzled. Um, and maybe he, he doesn't indicate tone in the letter, but he could be annoyed by it or find it humorous or just quirky. But to this is what makes me think it's sincere. He's not putting something on. He's hosting a hatter who was a good friend of his. I believe it's the hatter Nathaniel Balch, who was a friend of his, with others who would usually not be mingling with a hatter. So John Hancock is very prominent in Massachusetts. He is uh, he's in Lexington when the British march uh, on Lexington and Concord. Uh, he and Samuel Adams uh, together ride to Philadelphia, uh, you know, to the cheers of crowds as they yes. get there. And But how does John Hancock get appointed president of the Continental Congress? He's not a great military man, although he kind of dreams of being. Uh, he's he's he is an orator, but he's not a great orator. He's not a great thinker about ideology. Why is he appointed president of the Continental Congress at what is going to turn out to be the most critical time of this Congress? Yeah, the moment for him. He gets appointed because he's a moderate. The first president of the Second Continental Congress was Peyton Randolph from Virginia, and he was also the president of the First Continental Congress. He gets called home to Virginia to tend to, to colony legislative ma matters, and they look north for their next president. So um, Massachusetts was a populous state. It had a tremendous amount of clout because so many revolutionary activities took place there. Samuel Adams was too radical to serve as a president. I mean, that, that just would, he would not have been a popular choice, for example. But Hancock had that name recognition he was wealthy, so he had more to lose than an Adam's cousin, John or Samuel, for example. But he also had revolutionary credentials. He was uh, the target, supposed to be that target on the morning of the battles of Lexington and Concord. His persecution by the British was known by other colonies. So he satisfied sort of all sides that he was conservative because of his wealth and his track record of sort of going in and then out. He's from Massachusetts, strong revolutionary credentials. And then he himself has some history of being a, a, a very against the British Empire and taking strong stands. But this is the single most important in his life, and he wouldn't have known it. No one would have known it at the time, that this would be what propels him for us to all know his name today. So and, and but of course, what we know his name for mostly is his signature, right? Yes. So uh, for those of us watching, why else should we remember him? What else? What is his role in Congress, and and is he successful at it? Is he is he good? Uh, what what part does he play in in that Second Continental Congress? So the beyond writing his name, 
he, yeah, so the so the president serves as mostly a moderator to filter ideas, and it's a very demanding job because the Congress would meet in two sessions, and uh, Hancock had a secretary assigned to him, and then he needed another at some point, and at some point his wife was helping out with some of his sort of administrative duties. He is the longest serving president of the Second Continental Congress. Um, and that's saying something because most, and he served for two years. So most delegates would not be able to serve that long. So just that commitment alone to shepherding the United States during the outbreak of war and the first two years and declaring independence meant that he had a, was, was doing a great job at overseeing a chaotic Congress. They had to move several times because of British troops arriving and Hancock was, was overseeing all of that. Now your question about why we should remember him is a, I think a very different question because I don't think it's tied to Congress, to his time serving in Congress specifically. And we can get into it, but that's why we know him. And yep. um, Rick, you put up the picture, but his signature is the biggest by far. And even though this isn't really something that can be judged except by your eyes, it is one of the most beautiful signatures. When he's got a, I mean, you, you, we, I, I was going to make a zoom in and I didn't, but he's got a, he's got almost like a logo under his name. Yeah, it's called a paris. And that was a sign of gentility. It showed training and practice to be able to sign like that. And I encourage everyone who's listening, and by the way, thanks for tuning in, um, to- yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, we thank you also. <laughs> yeah, um, to Google, the Declaration of Independence, the National Archives has, has it on their website. That's the keeper of the declaration. And zoom in because there's some attempts at Paris, those uh, markings underneath the name, that are pretty clumsy. And From other people. Wanted, What's that? From other people. From other from other delegates. And then if you really look at it, I mean, Hancock's signature is spectacular. It, it, there's just nothing. There's no other way to say it. Um, and I think that that he's the first to sign the Declaration of Independence and have such a beautiful signature is um, something that is 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 po poetic. Now, um, but 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 do you suppose that I guess this would be a cartoon? Right would be Hancock signs it crumples up that one he signs I'm not saying crumples up that maybe he no, crumples up three or four or five of these then he signs it then everybody else has to actually get theirs right the first time but he's got multiple times to do it yeah that would be a cartoon for sure you've got one shot but this is this is kind of my point is that it, it, that Paris being perfectly executed showed training and practice. There is a letter from 1764 of Hancock's or 1765, and the signature is very similar. Um, the paraph has changes a little in the 11 years, but this was even uh, the Olive Branch petition signed just the year before. The signature is very similar. So this was something that he practiced a lot. Can, can I bring bring in a, a question yeah. from from Wally here? Wally, Wally wants to know. Uh, so was his signature first, or just big in center page? And it was first, right? Because we have this image, uh, Brooke, uh, and and you. We have a photo. We have this image of everybody going there for the signing of the declaration. But in fact, it they, they don't do it that way, right? That's right. So thanks for the question, Wally. He is biggest. Uh, because he's the president of the Second Continental Congress, and also he he tended to sign his name pretty large when compared to the script of letters, for example, the, the letter, the text of the letter, and then he would sign much bigger. He's He is the only one who needs to sign the declaration to authorize it. And he does that on July 4th, not on the page we just saw. That engrossed copy was made by Congress and signed by most people in August of 1776. And, but not everyone signed the same day. So Hancock's is first and center because he's the president. It's really, that's the, that's the, um, the only reason because he was the only one needed. And then the rest of the delegates signed below according to their colony. 
So the Massachusetts delegates are all lumped together in the Virginia and Pennsylvania. Okay. So uh, one of the other things I, I wanted to get into um, a little bit, because it's a very interesting part of your book, uh, and picking up on the idea of Congress, uh, president of the Continental Congress, eventually he's there the longest. He's, it's time for him to go. He's worn himself out. Uh, and he's getting ready to ride off into the sunset. And people are talking about giving him a, 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 a formal thank you from Congress. Yeah. And and it's shot down. And interestingly, it's shot down uh, in part by most of the members of his own state's delegation. Uh, and in fact, Adams uh, in particular is as opposed to this idea. So um, why doesn't he get the thanks of Congress? And maybe roll that into what's Adams' beef with because <laughs> it seems to be a pretty big beef. Yeah, it's a big decades long beef. Yeah. yeah. Okay. When Hancock is leaving, they say we should we should vote to or we should um, vote to send a formal thank you to Hancock for being a president, for being the president. And Adams opposes saying this. You're not serving for a thank you. You're serving because great or good. But I found many instances of where where Congress issues a formal thank you to somebody. So it's not that unusual. Uh, but Samuel Adams, the beef with Hancock go, extends for decades, really begins in the 1760s and goes until the 1780s. Adams, Samuel, and also John, but I'll talk really specifically about Samuel, finds Hancock to be too showy, too ostentatious, too concerned, with um, public image, he also finds him too moderate. I think that's the, the real problem is that Adams wants Hancock to lend his weighty name, his social influence to, to Adams's causes and oppositions uh, to, the, to British rule at the time. And Hancock doesn't do his bidding that much. Sometimes he'll go along with Adams, but he isn't as malleable as he might seem uh, to be. So that's that's part of the beef. And it, it only gets reconciled in the late 1780s. And we can talk about that or not. But um, part of it is that Hancock just sort of offends his sensibilities about <laughs> what it means to, to um, be a legislator at this time. And I think in some ways, Adams misses the point he he thinks that Hancock is popular because or or he's offended that Hancock's popular because he's showy. But that's part of why Hancock was popular. He was so skilled at using his public image, which, as we've said, is so above, visibly above those that he's seeking votes from or um, support from. He, he uses it to such great skill that I think that annoys Adams, that someone can care so much about their clothing and their presentation and entertaining these sort of things that Adams thinks no one should should care about. But Hancock uses them to to great effect. So so let me ask you a question that I, I'm, I'm just curious about. It's not something you mentioned in the book, but there's a saying which. I'm going out on a limb here. Supposedly okay. comes from colonial times, but I don't have the source, so I could be wrong, which was a description of the relationship between uh, Hancock and Adams, which was that Adams writes the letters and Hancock pays the postage. Right. Yeah. Tell me, give yeah, me a response to that. variations of this that John Adams, much later in his life, much, much later, he writes that... Uh, the, he and Samuel were walking through Boston and they paused at the base of Beacon Hill and looked up to Hancock's mansion at the top of Beacon Hill. And they, and there we go. Nicely done, Rick. Um, <laughs> and they look up at the base and Samuel says to John, um, Boston has done a wise thing by electing Hancock today. This is in 1765. For they've made that young man's fortunes their own. Now I don't buy that story at all because it it's it's showing it, it's saying that somehow Samuel Adams and John Adams knew that there would be a war, a de more than a decade later, th that somehow they'd form their own country. So uh, that story is, um, I think, John Adams looking back and and trying to 
figure things out uh, and, and line up Samuel Adams' cunning and smarts and um, ability to, to, to see the future. So there's so to your point, there's a lot of stories about Hancock's fortune being used to pay for the revolution. But that isn't really a charge that we hear from his contemporaries while he's alive, whether charge being good or bad. Um, they don't use it as his credit saying, oh, he paid for this. And certainly his supporters would have would have said something like that. So I think it's a, I think it's a way to understand the revolution after the fact. And in some ways, Chris, this might get at your question, too, about his popularity um, and how he's remembered that that maybe as people were trying to to find a place for him, they say, oh, his place was because he was wealthy. So I don't know the origin of why that story came about, but it comes later after his death. Well, I was going to kind of add to the kind of the conversation because it touches on Rick's question in my earlier one. But I mean, a lot of the things that were, I guess, popularly known about him is that our, our impressions that Adams leaves, like, you know, that whole he really wanted to be general. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so was a lot of what we know about. Is that true or, or is that just Adams being jealous that that Hancock was the cool kid at the party and he wasn't? I think it's the I think it's the latter there. Yeah. Adams. John Adams specifically, as you you all may know, he's he's a terrific gossip. He has something to say about everyone, but rarely himself. Um, yeah. And he he criticizes far and wide. He resents the attention that George Washington gets. He resents the attention Benjamin Franklin gets. John Hancock gets. I mean, he he really. Um, it, it seems like sour grapes a lot of times. Uh, we do know a lot about Hancock from his contemporaries, from what they said about him, both positive and negative. So that's mm. certainly true. But it's not just John Adams where we get a sense of who he is, because that wouldn't be enough for me. Um, for example, you read that quote about um, him treating everyone like a brother or a relative. That's from just an observer of Hancock. Right. So was it, I mean, to, to, writing about John Hancock, he's not leaving behind the volume of letters that diaries, yeah. et cetera, that John Adams or Alexander Hamilton left behind or George Washington. Did that make it harder to write about him because you're kind of harder to get inside his head about what he's doing? Yeah, it's certainly. I There's so many times where the record is silent, just silent, and I want something from him. Um, but there's there's enough that we can to to get a sense of him certainly of his own writings it's just not the volumes that that some of the other founders left not not at all and and so you know so you just said founders and one of the th questions i wanted to put to you and this is it seems to be as good a place as any is 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 Hancock in the first the first tier of the founding fathers, or is he a secondary player? I know many many shows ago, uh, Rick and I had a very intense discussion about um, a certain finance person and whether he was actually a a, a founding father or he kind of came along later, Mr. Hamilton. So, would you consider Han was Hancock? You know, is he is he a a Washington to Jefferson, is, or is he just kind of a there? Well, I think I need to know your tears. I need to know your last person okay. in tier one <laughs> and your first in tier two to know where he lands. Okay. Who's your first in tier two? Chris. Who's my first in tier two? Well, I'm the wrong person to ask this question. Elbridge, um, Elbridge Gary? I mean, yeah, uh, sure. Oh, I, no, no, no. Elbridge He's way ahead of Elbridge Gary. No, no, okay. So, so from Gary Gary. Is tier one. All right. yeah. so, so Samuel Adams, he causes a lot of trouble. He gets everybody riled out. People start shooting each other, and he's gone. He's just like not even part of the equation. He's not. He's not helping to craft great bills of state. He's not. So I. So Hancock. So I would say I would call Sam Adams a second tier. Okay. Would, Ooh, that's harsh. Well, you asked. I'm. No, no, what? I didn't. Well, I did ask. Okay, tier yeah, did. one. Are we talking tier ones? Jefferson, Franklin, Washington, yeah. Yeah. John Adams. Yeah. And then guys, guys that are on coins and money. Right, I know, but right. This is the, why isn't John Hancock on a five dollar bill? 
Thank I you. mean, he he should be on money if, if for no other reason than because he was so wealthy. Because right. well. he was a money guy. Um, yeah, I mean, who gets put on money? That's a whole different discussion. <laughs> but um, Next if, week on History Happy Hour, who yeah, gets put if, on money and why? Uh, if you're putting Samuel Adams in tier two, and yeah. I counted five for your tier one, yeah. then Hancock would probably be tier two. Okay. But... If you were living in 1790 and reflecting back on well, the revolution, the, the beginning in 1763 with the end of the French and Indian War, Hancock would be a tier one. I think that's what's kind of tricky about it is he was so popular nationally that, um, and people knew his name, they knew his sacrifices, uh, during the time they knew him for the Declaration of Independence. And then when he supported the Constitution, which wasn't a given that that right. he would right. or that Massachusetts would ratify. That. So even Elbridge Gary, your tier two, Rick, gives Hancock credit for, he said his name will basically live on because of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So I, I think, think Elbridge that, Gary is tier three. Yeah, he's- How dare friend. you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think he's. I think I mean, he's, if you can only be vice president, I mean, it, come on. Um, uh, so, so yeah. So with that, with these sort of imprecise tiering right, systems, sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we'll, <laughs> I think if he lived at the time, he would have been tier one. Okay, but he's gone down in the you know maybe to tier two. So yeah. listen, so so we've been talking a lot about politics, and we will some more. But hey, let's get into some gossip like John Adams would like. Yeah. Uh, so so John Hancock gets married in 1775, and he marries Dolly Quincy, who actually was there with him in Lexington, along with his aunt Lydia, uh, at the Hancock Clark House, and 14 other people who were there um, uh, on the night of April 19th, 18th, 1775. But he's almost 40 when he gets married, which is kind of old. And um, um, he's married till his death, but you I, you kind of suggest that it's a, it's a little bit one-sided of a, of a relationship, uh, that he, he's writing to her a lot, and she's not writing back much, which and it sort of suggests that maybe there's a little coolness there. But can you delve into that relationship a little bit? Yeah, and this is one of those instances where Dolly is silent. We don't hear from her at all. It is not it is not that we don't hear from Hancock in these instances. It's that we don't hear from her, which is telling you something. Um, so he he is very old by 18th century standards, North American English standards to get married. Um, he had courted a woman before that for 10 years before calling it off. And that's very unusual too. Uh, Dorothy Quincy comes, who goes by Dolly, Dorothy Quincy comes from a good family. That is a strong name. The name of Quincy, Massachusetts comes from that, her, her lineage. So it's a it's a it's a good match for him because of the name and and then of course it's a good match for her because of his name and wealth. But she is decidedly not interested in um in Hancock it seems socially that it could be because his work was so demanding at times that she didn't feel any connection to him that she didn't see him that much and um, it, it was all driven by work. We have an account from her much later in her life. She told somebody who then wrote it down that she worked, she didn't like being in Philadelphia during the Second Continental Congress. She was one of the only wives at a time. She was the only wife there and had to help Hancock with, with some of these administrative duties. And that didn't appeal to her at all. So that could have been part of the reason for the coldness is that she she just didn't feel connected to him uh, because he was busy with work. It, they also just may have just, it, it was a match in good names and it was finally time for Hancock to get married, but it it, it is not a fulfilling relationship. It seems. And, and you, and you write about the fact that he, 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 he writes to her and says, why won't you write me? I'm writing you all the time. You're not responding to me. Please yeah. write me a letter. I beg you, write me a letter. And she just doesn't. Yeah. And he says, I'm sending you a gift. Like, please let me know if you liked it. Did you try on the, did you see if the fabric suits you? Here's a gift for our daughter. 
and he, he and, and and he poses it's i mean it's really sad mm. because he writes at one point and says let's make a deal all i'm using modern language he didn't say this but um this is the crux of it that let's make a deal i'll write you one letter and then you write me one back and then i'll write you one and you'll and letters nothing, nothing. um mm. so so yeah i mean you, you he, the other thing is i will just say i i guess not even in Dolly's defense, she can feel however she wants about him, but um, <laughs> but but she um, she is not the only person that Hancock pleads with for more letters. He, he writes this. This comes through his correspondence a lot. Please write me. Please tell me what's happening. I don't hear enough from my friends in Boston. So so it's not just Dolly that he's wanting those letters from. And this gets back to one of the ways we started this conversation is that Hancock just loves to connect with people. And at this time, getting a letter from someone meant a lot to him and he didn't get it enough in his mind. So um, I, I do want to, you know, we, we've talked quite a bit and we're getting closer to the end. So I, I don't want to leave out kind of the rest of the story because one of the things that you talk about, I think, very effectively, um, and it's important, is his, his role in the Constitution and how we, you know, it, it, that it's on a knife edge. And I don't think that that's a part of the story that we know enough about. So tell us a little bit about kind of his place in that. And also, if you could maybe tack on sort of his view of, of how these states are supposed to now function as a country, because I would say it's a little bit different. Yeah, to, to just quickly address your second question first, he doesn't know how the states are going to function under this right. new federal government. I mean, that's part of the problem. Right. But to, to back up and go with your first question, while we think of the Constitution today, because it still governs the United States today, as being inevitable almost, um, it certainly wasn't. Its ratification was anything but assured. And by the time it got to Massachusetts to ratify, five states had already ratified. And so, and you only needed nine. The Constitutional Convention decided unilaterally that you don't need 13 states to ratify, you just need nine. And so they're already halfway to this point, but Massachusetts hasn't weighed in and they're, they are considered by contemporaries. This isn't a historian saying this after the fact, this is people at the time saying that they were considered in essence, a swing state that if they ratified, New Hampshire likely would, New York would likely be, be more likely, Virginia would be more likely to ratify it. Uh, because it, it had a high population and because of its strong revolutionary credentials. Washington and George Washington and James Madison even write saying, Washington says, we will be affected here, here being Virginia by what happens in Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, it was about 50-50 um, split for and against the Constitution. With if, if we had to tip the scales, historians believe that it tips more towards um, not ratifying than ratifying. And Hancock is the president of the ratifying convention in Massachusetts, and he's governor. And he's the most popular man in Massachusetts still. And so Federalists, that is those who support the Constitution, the ratification, know that that's their guy to lobby. Okay. So, yeah, I'm sorry. If um, we can talk more, I just didn't uh, want to. Oh, no, no. Well, no. We, and, 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 but, he, but he comes in and, and, uh, uh, and, and to the convention and favors the, the Constitution as long as as, as they can also say, well, as long as we can also get a Bill of Rights, right? As, as long as right. We yeah, he doesn't use that term, Bill of Rights, but the Federalists lobby him and they say, if you come out in support, they have, a, they have a couple of really enticing prospects. They say, you might become president if Virginia doesn't ratify. Everyone knew that if Virginia ratified it, George Washington would be president. Then they said, well, you might become vice president if you ratify. So they were dangling this very appealing prospect out to Hancock. And they also said, if you ratify, you can make changes. You can propose changes to the Constitution. And no state had done that yet, partly because the rules for ratification said 
you ratify it or you don't. You either take this new system or we keep the broken Articles of Confederation. And so this was um, something new. And I think the, the Federalists, I mean, they wouldn't have offered this if they could have gotten it to ratify assuredly without it. And so Hancock stands up at the convention in a very dramatic moment and says that he's going to come forward and, and vote to ratify, but that he has these proposed changes. And every state thereafter proposes changes to the Constitution. And those all those changes, also amendments, get sent to James Madison, and they ultimately filter down to the 10 Bill of Rights that we know today. So while we think of the Bill of Rights as inseparable from the Constitution, it was actually passed a couple years later and wasn't part of the, the, the framers of the Constitution original goal. So it's for those that had some, the Bill of Rights is we can, we can look to those who had concerns about the Constitution as the reason we have it today. Chris, you did you have one more? Or you, or you? Well, no, I was just I was going to say that one of the I, to biographers in particular, I like to ask. Um, you know, obviously, there's an awful lot in the book, and there's an awful lot that uh, we didn't get to cover that you'll read about when you buy your own copies. Um, but what is the thing that you wanted to put in the book that you couldn't, or is what what would you like to add? What else should we know about Hancock that they're not going to find out in the book? Um. I, what I wish I could have put in the book, as far as I know, doesn't exist. And, right. and that is where the records are silent. There's more that I would have wanted to know about his relationship to the people who worked for him, both enslaved and then when eman emancipated as paid servants. I would have wanted to know more about his relationships and um, with women, what that courtship was like for 10 years and then to call it off. So um, the juicy stuff is in the book. Uh, yeah. It wouldn't, uh, stuff didn't get cut. It's more what I couldn't add because we didn't have the source. I didn't have the sources for them. Yeah, and I just want to be. I want to be clear, folks. That there's plenty in the book, and I'm not saying she left anything <laughs> on. I just no, want to make sure. Yeah. Right. yeah. But, and, okay, but 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 last question, and now we're in the lightning round. All okay. right. But um, should have should have been the first question. Why is the book called King Hancock? Oh, oh yeah. Funny. That's so major. Okay, lightning round. Uh, <laughs> after the Boston Tea Party in 1774, the British occupy Boston, British officers, and they question this guy named Samuel Dyer, a Bostonian, and they say, who ordered the destruction of the tea? That is the Boston Tea Party. And he says, nobody. And this British officer says, you're a damned liar. It was King Hancock and the damned Sons of Liberty. That is the first time in 1774 that we hear this nickname being used, and it's being used derisively as an insult. It's clever because it captures Hancock's in immense popularity, but it also puts down the colonists for being these sort of bumpkins that the best they can do as a king is this guy on the top of Beacon Hill, John Hancock. Okay, here's where it gets interesting, and this you have to hear as part of this story is on the day that the Revolutionary War began in Lexington and Concord, the battles of Lexington and Concord, British troops have to retreat 20 miles out of Concord home to Boston. And they are being fired on by colonists in the countryside the whole way home. And it's worse than just being fired on. They can't see where they're being fired from because colonists are hiding behind walls and inside homes. And so these British soldiers are being fired on. They can't see their attackers. And then their humiliation continues because colonists cry out as the British are retreating, King Hancock forever. So they had taken this insult and appropriated it to make it a rallying cry on the day the fighting began. That is Hancock's power. That, well, I, at the time, he'd be a tier one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the title of the, the, well the done. copy, King Hancock, a tier one. Well yeah. done, John Hancock. Well done, Brooke Barbier. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Brooke's book is King Hancock, uh, and it's the story of John Hancock. There's that great signature on the cover. It's definitely worth uh, worth a read. Brooke, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. <laughs> She's got them all. Thank Excellent. you so much. Uh, Chris, I want to remind people, we talked about this uh, uh, a little bit um, 
uh, a few weeks ago. But I want to remind people that I am going to be speaking at a World War II uh, convention You're in be uh, working on your tan. Tampa, Florida, uh, which is in January. And it's called uh, A New Look at World War II. Uh, how American technology and diversification helped win World War II in 1944 and started the American military, the new American military. And I'm pasting the uh, the link there. It's January 25th through 27th. I've pasted the link into the chat so people can copy that. Uh, I'm going to be there. Alex Kershaw is going to be there. Helen Patton is going to be there. Todd DePestino, who wrote that great book about um, uh, the... Um, boom, um, the cartoonist, Bill Malden, yes, um, yeah, yeah sure. is going to be there. And so it should be a great event. So please check that out. Uh, and, uh, and you'll and, get to see Rick in Bermuda shorts. And, you know, so. you'll, you get to see me in, in Bermuda <sighs> shorts or something. I, I don't know exactly. But uh, we'll, 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 we'll work that out. Here's the uh, – here's the there it is. Okay, there it is on the screen also. Uh, next week, Chris. Yeah. Next really week. Yeah, I'm really excited. We have uh, David Kenyon, uh, and he's talking about uh, his new book on the Bletchley Park's role in the Arctic convoys uh, and the war, uh, Battle of the Atlantic. And for those of you who don't know, uh, David Kenyon is the historian for Bletchley Park, and he wrote an absolutely stellar book about the role that Bletchley Park played on D-Day. So I'm really looking forward to talking about this, his next book, because I'm sure it will be out of sight. And he is the man responsible for historical research in support of all public content at Bletchley. So he's very knowledgeable. It's a terrific book. I read it. Uh, and it's it's got stuff about the the signal intelligence, but it's also these battles uh, on the uh, convoy run up to Murmansk involved aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers, submarines, merchant oh, ships, airplanes. It was it, in waves, a lot of cold waves. A lot of cold waves. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty incredible. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Back yeah. us on Patreon and browse historyhappyhour.com. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. <laughs>